Welcome to the Wisdom Window on Strong Island Radio. The Wisdom Window is your portal to timeless knowledge and understanding. Join us each episode as Maddie Cheers and Marianne Franzisi examine ancient and current wisdom traditions and apply these teachings to today's unique challenges. So let's get started and welcome your hosts, Maddie and Marianne. Hello and welcome to Wisdom Window. I am Marianne Franzisi and I'm here with my co-host Maddie Cheers. Hi Maddie. Hi Mayor. So good to be back. Today we have the incredible opportunity to continue our conversation with Cal Kaplan and we are talking about biblical psychotherapy and Cal is a clinical psychologist and also a um, author of many, many books on this topic of biblical stories versus Greek stories. And part of your latest work, Cal, is really looking at these texts as a means to suicide prevention. And truly, it is a tremendous human crisis right now, the Mm -hmm. numbers of people who do end their lives through suicide. So how can these stories be used to prevent suicide with people? I think by helping them center on themselves, that realizing that purpose of life comes from within, doesn't have to be shopped for at a grocery store. Hmm. Very interesting. That doesn't mean you can't learn ways of fulfilling your purpose. You can learn techniques. You can learn tools. You can learn methods. But ultimately, your sense of what's important comes from who you are. And do you see that as the heart of the problem right now? Is that so much of the search is outside of ourselves? You mean in terms of the problem of suicide? Yes, yes. I, th- I think so. Okay. I think so. I think, um, I'm not saying it's, it's uh, in every case, but I think um, among many young people, it's a, really a, a search for, for something, and they don't even know what they're searching for. It's like, I think I call it searching for meaning in all the wrong places. Right. They put themselves, rather than center around who they are, they run away from self. I think there's this um, old, there's this Israeli uh, philosopher, I think his name was Avram Shlansky, who I think my uncle told me he once said, no matter how high you jump, you can't jump above your own pukuk. <laughs> which is belly button. Uh-huh. You can't jump above your own belly button, you know, so it's right. You're, you're stuck with who you are. The issue is not to deny who you are, which is what's going on today in terms of sexual identity, racial identity. Yeah, I can choose to be an aborigine uh, teenage woman. It's nonsense. But if you look at all the ways that the, the culture has bended to this nonsense, that identity is simply whatever we say it is, that's exactly what it is. People are looking they're forgetting that they have a basis. Now, I'm not saying that, that people can't change certain things, whether it be gender or whatever. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that we, have, we are who we are. We can make adjustments. We can, we can certainly make certain changes. But we can't run away from who we are. Mm. Mm. We, we can't kill ourselves to be something else. Well, that's, what is it we're killing? Yeah. And I think that's the question. I think that's why your comparison of the Greek influence versus the biblical, ancient biblical influence, the Old Testament influence, is so very important. Because it is a choice. It's been a choice by governments. It's been a choice by individuals as to how we are going to train our children to live in the world. 
So you gave us a couple of stories last time that help you in your work with with young people and all people who might consider suicide. Are there other stories you wanted to add to the, the ones from last week? Yes, I, I, I can think of it here. One of them is, is a fascinating story that people don't really realize the import of. It's a comparison of Antigone the, the Oedipus's daughter yes. and Ruth. Okay. Okay. Now, I hope I'm not shocking anybody by what I'm saying, but they're both products of incest. Right. Right. Ruth is a Moabitess, and Moab means from the father. Indeed. So you remember the story of of Lot and Sodom, as Lot and his two daughters come out of Sodom, his wife. It's turned to a pillar of salt because she looks back at this evil city, according to the, the book of Com. Right. I think he's the last man in the world. So each of them get him drunk separately and lie with him, and each becomes impregnated by him. And Ruth is um, name. She comes Moab um, from the father. Well, so she has a history of incest, right? Right. In her family. It's true. She comes from an incestuous background. Antigone also comes from an incestuous background. She's the daughter of Oedipus and his mother, Jocasta. Okay, now let's look what happens to them. Ruth becomes a mother, a daughter-in-law exemplar to Naomi. She said, Whether thou goest, I will go. Then she becomes a wife to Boaz, a mother. Uh, I forget his son's name. Um, and um, Naomi's brought in as a, uh, as, as a nursemaid. And this becomes the line in Ju Judaism, the Davidic line. And in Christian terms, it's the line of Jesus of Nazareth. So Ruth becomes the woman <laughs> exemplar. <laughs> and she is a child of incest. Not the child, but the servant. Few generations back, she has an incestuous background, wouldn't you say? Right. Yes. Now Antigone also has an incestuous background, right? She's the daughter of Oedipus and his mother. Now, when Antigone means in Greece, in Greek, there are different ways of looking at it. I think it means anti-generativity, anti-generate. So she rejects motherhood. And there's this great line that's not always translated in, in um, Sophocles Antigone, I think, where, he, where she says, oh, oh, what happens in that story is Oedipus is now gone and his two sons, Polynicus and Antigles, are fighting to take over the throne. But Uncle Creon is running the show and he, um, he, he, um, one of them kills the other out. Oh, let's see, let's see how it goes. Um, one of them kills the other outside the wall of Thebes, the seven, seven gate. And um, I think Polynicus, who was considered to be the rebel, is left unburied by Creon. We can't bury him, but not to bury a living, a dead person is considered a great sacrilege mm -hmm. in Greek thought. So Antigone rises against her uncle and buries him. Mm. It becomes the symbol of courage in a way. And in return, he buries her alive. Oh. Oh. Killing her. But there's a line that isn't brought down in most translations. That is a deeply troubling line about Antigone, which get, goes into the my analysis. She says, and I'm paraphrasing, if it was a husband or a son left unburied, okay, I can always replace them with another. But I can't replace I can't replace a brother. She's enmeshed in her family of origin. Hmm. Which is what happens sometimes when you have a dysfunctional family, especially when you have an incestuous family. So Ruth thrives and becomes a mother and uh, 
ancestors of the Davidic line, a wonderful daughter-in-law, a wonderful wife. And Tigami kills herself. Mm. And although one can look at her as courageous against Creon, and it was courageous, the line that usually is omitted from translation is that she's mentioned in the family of origin because she said she wouldn't have done it if it had been a, um, a son or a husband because you can replace them. Well, that's the essence of a mesh family structure. She's a fashion of mesh in her family of origin. It's, it's a terrible story. <laughs> it's terrible for women, that's for sure. <laughs> so yeah. what do you think made the difference for Ruth? I think she came out of a biblical tradition. <laughs> <laughs> Relationship again with God? Yeah, yeah. Well, and I also think in the... Jewish tradition in the biblical that version in that tradition we we are taught to have a purpose to to be available to the family be available to the community and in turn the family and the community are available to us Very so good. that relates that that relates back to the story you told last week where the angel comes down and and gives Elijah food and gives him and comfort, comfort rest. and listens to him and tells him to rest so that so that there's there's that that story this is how we treat somebody who's on the verge we don't just turn away from them exactly exactly god bless you exactly <laughs> Want to hear another comparison? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this is a story that most people don't realize. Um, it's a story comparing the Roman general Coriolanus. I don't know if you saw a great film with Ray Fiennes and Coriolanus. It's one of Shakespeare's great plays. Yeah. That's, that's underperformed. Coriolanus was a general in um, Rome. I forget his full. I forget his name. Coriolanus is his honor, and and he is honored for being a tremendous warrior. But he's a very inflexible fellow, and he gets into a fight in Rome, a class fight between the proletariat and the plebeians. Etc. And he winds up being exiled from Rome. Okay. So he's a refugee, right? Mm -hmm. King David is also a refugee. He has to flee from Saul's wrath. Okay. And leave Israel. Or Saul's going to kill him. Out of jealousy. So each of them takes shelter in the enemy of their country. Mm -hmm. Corlanus goes to fight on the side of the Volskis, vowing vengeance against Rome. David winds up in the army of the Philistines. The people don't realize he fights on the side of the Philistines. But by, according to the biblical account, he does not fight against the Israelites. He fights against common enemies of the Israelites and the Philistines. And in the big battle where ultimately Saul and Jonathan are killed, What's David going to do? You know, he, so it turns out that he doesn't know what to do. Is he really going to fight against the Israelites? You know, so he is told, it's like a baseball player who's been traded in a way. Is he, is he, what are you going to do? So it turns out King Achish of the Philistines says to him, I'm really sorry, but my generals don't trust you. They're afraid you're going to leave the battle in the middle of, of the battle and go to side fight on the side of the Israelites. So David, I'm sure, breathes a sigh of relief. And he says, I understand. I will always be loyal to my king. Okay. But what king is he referring to? It's one of the most it's delicious lines in all literature. <laughs> I always be loyal to my king. Is he talking about Saul or is he talking about Achish? We never know. And then Saul and Jonathan get killed in that battle, and David comes back and becomes um, um, king of Israel. The difference between the two characters is that David is a flexible figure. 
Uh, Even in described in his uh, battle with Goliath. He dances around, he shoots slingshots, and Goliath is this big, hulking brute. And, uh, and really, Coriolanus is more like a Goliath figure. He's big and he's, I'm not sure how big he is, but he's rigid. Right. So right. this argues in a way that a certain flexibility is suicide preventive and a certain rigidity is, is suicide agenda. Exactly. And I think that I think that in looking at flexibility, we that's we were talking earlier. Marianne and I were talking earlier about being being stuck in the idea of I have to be right and I have to prove to you that I'm right, and that we were we brought up this idea of empathy and how. There's a lot of accusation on both sides that, that in, in politics that one side is not empathic. So, but if you're accusing people of not having empathy, then you're not having empathy. So, and I, I actually believe what you just said is very important. There has to be a degree of flexibility if Absolutely. we are ever going to bring everybody together and find a way through all this divisiveness. And a lot of this divisiveness is causing young people so much anxiety that I think it does have something to do with the rise in the suicide rate. Well, well and I, think I also does. think internally it, it's similar, right? right? So this internal landscape where if we're held to a, a certain goal of achievement, being the strongest, the right, the most powerful versus making good use of the life you've been given right. and sinking into this idea of shaping your life in a more flexible, uh, really, um, what's the word? Like, it's not so much realistic, but just a kinder way, like just really allowing for a little bit more um, room inside of you. You know, this, this, what you're saying is so interesting. Because I wrote a piece a few years ago, and I wasn't sure I was right at all. A lot of times <laughs> I write these things, and I've been sure if I'm right. It Which is, again, a flexible a mindset. Flexible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe I'm but, not uh, right. So this was the idea that there's something very different about the biblical and Greek creation stories and origin. Mm. That in the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, in the Greek world, um, the world is chaotic, chaos, which has mm. to be subdued. In the Greek world, in the biblical world, we have tohu vavohu, which is a formlessness, right? Formlessness. So it occurred to me that these were not the same at all. That if you're dealing with chaos, God has to be a jailer. Uh, mm. And this is what, uh, in a way, Zeus is. He's a jailer. Mm. If you're dealing with tohu vavohu, you need to be a potter. You need to shape it. You don't need to. You don't need to step on it, and condemn it, and not Contain give it breathing it, air. Right. And I think that's the biblical view that God is a potter, mm. and and that and that tohu vavo is formlessness. But that doesn't mean it's chaos that it has to be subdued. It's just formlessness which has to be helped to give form. That is beautiful that because is. of the inner chaos, right? That we experience when we are in turmoil mental, spiritual, physical turmoil feels like such chaos and the push towards getting that under control or judging it or making it bad versus using it to form into what's coming next. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm. And, and that relates something that I did what I was calling biblicizing Eric Erickson. <laughs> or I argue that you have to um, go backward to go forward. Mm. Sometimes you got to go two steps backward to go three steps forward. Yes, very then true. Then you're going backward in um, in the level, but you're still moving forward in stage. Yeah. So, for example, if you're a four-year-old and you're king 
of the play of, of your of your family playroom, and then all of a sudden you go off to kindergarten. You're not a king anymore. You're a peon. <laughs> you but it's a it's a move ahead, but yeah. it's a regression back. Yes. And you, then you have to move ahead to become king of the uh, kindergarten. And then the same thing happens again and again in life where we master one life stage, but that's just a prelude of moving ahead to the next life stage. But we're going to go backward to go forward. Yes. We're going to go backward. A person who feels that they got everything together and they're in a wonderful relationship and they get married and they're, oh my God. I didn't think this way. This was going to be like this, you know. And they have to go back to the task before. Maybe they were living in their parents' home, and many of the daily activities were taken care of. And all of a sudden, they're on their own home, mm-hmm. and they have to do these things. So at first, it's it, it's a regression back to move ahead. And I think that's what life is. That we have to go backward. It's not a straight line. It's like going up. And it's like a cycle. It's like a a spiral. <laughs> yeah, spir- mm-hmm. a spiral. Right. We go backwards to go forwards. I think that's, I think Erickson's original view didn't talk about the going backwards to go forward, but I, I did a piece in which I did that. And I think that's what wisdom is. I think that's why, why, especially in the native world, we have wisdom keepers because you have to, you're expected to look back. You're expected to go to the wisdom keepers, find out what they learned from their life experience and yes. how can that apply to your life experience, even though you're young now and they were young then, there's there's that that interplay of generations that that is so important that we don't forget what happened in the past because it can inform us of how to move on in our own future. And that's well, why, know, uh, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. So, no, you so, go ahead. I'll building on that point, I, I think that's one of the real problems in the Greek world that the Greek philosophers, some of them, just didn't like Greek myths. Hmm. They didn't like it. They, 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 I don't think Plato liked them. Greek myths very much. I, I'm not sure about the particular, but, but I think that philosophy in a way was at war with the mythos. Mm-hmm. In the biblical world, Haggadah or legends feed into Halacha. Yes. They're not opposed to each other. And that's very interesting. And this is what's happening in America. Right. Yep. Our yep. legends are being destroyed. Our stories are being destroyed. Look, if our stories are being destroyed, our founding stories, then how can our laws have any meaning? True. It becomes an empty shell, and that's what's happened. That's what's really so frightening to me about what's going on. A attack on the very symbols of America. And I'm not saying that certain symbols were not racist or certain symbols were not sexist or whatever. I'm not saying any of that. Okay, but you don't destroy the whole thing because what are you left with? You're left with a, a, a flat surface where nothing has any purpose. And these laws become just restrictions rather than, our, and I think in Judaism, laws are not seen as restrictions. No. They're, they're not at all. Because they're, they're tied to the stories beneath it and they're given color. And they and they pertain to the community's ability to function as a community. So I it's like I know that when my husband speaks on this subject, and we've had him on the show before, Robert Vetter, he talks about the ability to not throw out the baby with the bathwater, as He's they right. say. Yes, right. you have to correct injustices, and as you probably know, in Kabbalah, it's all about ri- rising because of correction, personal rising because you correct yourself, but then that then applies to the community. So the idea that you just knock everything down and start over is very destructive, and I think also relates to that sense of imbalance that can lead to suicide. And also, I love your subtitle of the play of your Oedipus series of seeing through listening, because I think that sometimes we do need to make certain stories less important so that stories that have been not told very often or have been buried Mm -hmm. can come to the surface and bring forward and center 
stories and storytellers who haven't had much of a chance to have their voice to tell their stories, right? And I'm just curious why you chose the subtitle Seeing Through Listening. Because Oedipus is blinded, you mm. see. And I think from a Jewish point of view, I, I, I have him in Jerusalem being tried at the Sanhedrin. Nathan runs it. I took poetic license and squished centuries, centuries together. But Nathan meets Oedipus, long run outside of Thebes. He hears Oedipus' story. He says, what the heck? You're innocent. He says, no, I'm the worst man in the world. Don't tell me I'm innocent. He's hanging on to his guilt. And Nathan says, poof, I'm going to take you to Jerusalem to the Sanhedrin. I know Sanhedrin didn't try on Jews, but forget that. So he takes him to the Sanhedrin, and uh, they find him, they, they acquit him. They say that he was entrapped by the Oracle of Delphi. Mm -hmm. And um, because when he asks her a question, who's my mother, who's my father? She tells him, you're going to kill your mother and marry your father, kill your father and marry your mother. But she doesn't tell him who they are, and then he tries to avoid doing that. He goes back to Ponce, runs away so he won't kill his adopted father and marries his dad. But that's not his real father. And on the way escaping, he does kill his real father, Lias, on the road to Thebes. And then he winds up marrying his mother, Jocasta, not knowing it's his brother. So basically, the whole idea that um, seeing becomes the the um, vehicle when he's blinded, when Oedipus is blinded in the, in the second play, this is where he begins to listen. Yeah. And this mm -hmm. is where Antigone, his daughter, I'm not, not Antigone, his other daughter, Aishmini, comes in. It's only when you begin to really listen and use your ears that things can change. And the Bible's filled with images of how important listening is. Yes. We, 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 Samson is condemned because he trusts his eyes too much. Mm. And um, so we need to listen. We don't say, see, O Israel. We say, Shema Israel. We hear. It's, 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 a, it's a verbal and it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it, it moves. It's not static. It's, it's a dynamic, hearing is dynamic. Now, what's interesting is motion pictures. Now, I don't think it's any accident that there were so many Jews involved in the motion picture industry. Because there was something about a immovable painting that goes against the Jewish way of thinking. Huh. <laughs> and something so Jewish about a motion picture yeah. about the picture changing over time that yeah. and we well, live in a world where only within the last that. century have we even had motion pictures we never had them before and then of course you had you know some of the impressionists who tried to change the idea of, of, of space but, but but finally now with motion picture if, if it's done for i'm not saying that they're not a bunch of terrible movies there are but but um the good movies really make use of time in a different way than you could just on um in um ordinary painting one of the things about um Rembrandt's paintings that always struck me so interestingly is i always felt they were dynamic i would look at the eyes person in a Rembrandt painting. Right. And it seemed to me that he was actually looking. Yes. Not yes. just simply that I was seeing a flat surface, but Rembrandt had this genius to make things come alive, move. Move. And given the medium he was working with. Right. These are just my own 
goofy thoughts. <laughs> well, they're good goofy thoughts. And I do think that motion pictures, movies, are the storytelling of our time. And there are yes. some great stories being told through the movies that th- that are that resonate with everyone. Stories like The Matrix, you know, that really has some very biblical overtones to it, it whether people realize it or not. But I think that the movies that become timeless become timeless because they speak to our humanity, whether it's through science fiction or it's through romantic comedy or it's through drama somewhere these timeless movies stay with us because they speak to our heart and And they speak to the fact that we're living beings yes 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 yes. it goes back to what you said on our our first talk together um which is that as you know if we want to understand what it means to be human look towards literature because right. they are these moments of a person through a particular period in time. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. So, Cal, thank you once again. I, I'm left feeling like there's much more to discuss, but this is the end of part two for us and the end of our time together right now, though in the flexible world. <laughs> May we meet again. <laughs> May we meet again. May we do this again sometime. So Let's one more well, thank you. One more time, please give us your contact information so that people can get a hold of you, find your books, and give us the titles of, of your books one more time too. Okay. Uh, the best contact email is calcap K A L K A P at AOL dot com. Uh, my website is Kalman Kaplan, K-A-L-M-A-N-K-A-P-L-A-N dot com. Um, what was the third question? The, the title. The, oh, the, Biblical Psychotherapy is one book. Right. Living Biblically is another book. A Psychology of Hope is another one. The Fruit of Her Hands is another one. Mm-hmm. Living a Purposeful Life is another one. And I'm doing not one now, I think it's going to be called Against Equity or something like that. Or It's going to be called, that's not going to be the title, but I wrote it, I'm writing it with a historian arguing that the um, there has to be a connection between, between our legal structure and our mythic structure, or mm. else the legal structure winds up um, dry. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, Tom Porter, Mohawk spiritual leader, makes the same argument in talking about why the great law of peace was not was not completely translated into the way the U.S. Constitution is written, though it is the basis of the U.S. Constitution, has to do with leaving out the storytelling. Very interesting. Can't wait for that book to come out. So yeah. thank you, everybody, for, for being with us once again. Thank you, Cal, so much thank for you, spending time my, with my us. Pleasure, really pleasure. appreciate it. And thank you, Bobby Lacerra and everybody here at Strong Island TV, Strong Island Radio, Strong Island Entertainment. And we hope to see you again next week for a wonderful new guest. Thank you all. Have a wonderful week. Thank you.